We're going to welcome our online family now. So, hi everyone out there on the internet. It's lovely to have you with us. Um, we've been thinking a little bit about God bringing us through, about um, uh, God being there when we're not aware of it even. Uh, God being beside us when we don't realise he's sitting beside us. Um, getting us through the tough times. He's there in the good times, but... Um, Sometimes we need to remind ourselves. I'm a little bit the, uh, the person who forgets about God when I'm in trouble. Uh, some people are really good at that. The minute there's trouble, strife, difficulty, they're on the line. Not me, I forget. Um, I'm pretty hopeless at that. I'm pretty good with God when things are rolling along nicely, but when things are difficult, I tend to forget he's there beside me. I need to remember that. All right, we're going to sing the same love. Most of you know well. 
Um, this was actually a song we sang at Annette and my wedding, so it's special to us. Um, you guys can go down. Um, so, yeah, feel free to sing while we have our offerings and tithes collected. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never come to an end. They are new. Someone's going to do a scripture reading. No? no? <laughs> uh, this goes on me for not arranging someone to do the scripture reading, so now I can do it. Uh, <laughs> So uh, this is from uh, Mark 9, and I believe it's 14 to 29, if memory serves me right. Um, And I'm reading off the screen, because this is how organized I am. (laughs) So it says, When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about here? A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, the disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, that kind can only come out by prayer. May God add blessing to the scripture reading this morning. And then it's me, actually. So, you know, I'm just going to grab the iPad and then start preaching. So let me just grab that. (laughs) um, I'm pretty amazed, actually, at what God can do. I don't know why I'm surprised, but it's a good surprise. I gave 
Neil, absolutely no idea of what I was preaching on um, and the way in which faithfulness has been a theme that's come up constantly uh, in the songs this morning is no accident and I'm thankful to your listening of the Spirit uh, and I'm thankful that uh, that's collided well with what I'm preaching on this morning, so thank you for your obedience. So, it's school holidays which means for me that I have the opportunity to prepare and plan ahead for next term's worth of children's programs. Part of me for that this week was coming up with a list of movies to watch in our Lego program, His Master Builders. I've decided to go with the Fruit of the Spirit theme next term, where we focus on a different fruit or a different characteristic each week. And while a lot of them were really easy to match up with children's movies, I still have a blank space next to faithfulness. You don't have to look far to find a children's movie about kindness or patience or joy, but faithfulness had me a bit stumped. Now, you can give me your movie suggestions at Morning Tea or if you're watching online, comment them below. But I suppose it's ironic that of all things to talk about this morning, I've chosen to preach on faithfulness. I was looking at the definition um, for the word faithfulness to figure out my approach to the children's movie question when I came across the following definition. Faithfulness, steadfast in affection or allegiance. Faithfulness, steadfast in affection or allegiance. I love this thought that when I'm singing, great is thy faithfulness, I'm saying, great is your steadfast affection and allegiance to me, Lord. That's powerful. But I wonder how effective this definition is when I try and apply the characteristic to my own faithfulness as it's seen in my life. Can I truly say that I am faithful to God, steadfast in my affection and allegiance to him? It's easy to jump to a yes, but I want to explore this in more depth this morning. I want to confront the question with honesty and to acknowledge the imperfections in human faithfulness. Because the less I paint myself in perfection, the more I come to know and rely on he whose faithfulness is abundant, unceasing and steadfast. Let's pray. God, I pray uh, as, as I speak this morning, you'll speak through me. I don't want it to be my words. I want it to be yours. I don't want it to be. Uh, I don't want it to be about me. I don't want it to be in a rush. I just want to take my time um, and give it to you. So I pray that you'll speak through me, uh, and may it be a blessing to those listening this morning. Amen. I learned a new word this week. I can't promise that I'm pronouncing it right, please forgive me, it's in Greek, but that word is pistuo. Now you may have already guessed, but this word translates as faith or belief. It's also the wo- where the word belief from the scripture reading today derives. Everything is possible for the one who believes, for the one who has pistuo. If belief is a cognitive acceptance of something as true and faith is the heart's acceptance of something as true, then pistuo is a head and heart kind of knowledge. And understanding the word belief in this passage to mean a head and heart kind of belief changes the way that we hear the story. Mark 9 verse 24 we read, Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe Help me overcome my unbelief. If belief, pistuo, is a knowledge in the mind and the soul, then unbelief is the conflict of or doubt in this knowledge in the mind and soul. How easy is it, though, to read belief and unbelief as some kind of opposites? How easy is it to interpret this man's exclamation as an impossible paradox? How easy is it to consider the two divisible into percentages? My beliefs that a solid 84% today and my unbeliefs only at a 16. It's easy to look at belief and unbelief as mutually exclusive. Yet in this passage, the boy's father is exclaiming, I do believe in the same breath as help me overcome my unbelief. 
unbelief coexisting with his belief. Unbelief alongside his belief, both of which were real to him at that time. Unbelief being something that was in and a part of his experience of what it was to have faith. Now, there's no ratio here of belief to unbelief. There's no minimum spend of belief needed to access the healing power of Jesus. In fact, in Matthew's account of the same miracle, we see this echoed again. After Jesus performs the miracle that has the demon leave the boy's body and the disciples question, why couldn't we drive it out? The answer that Matthew records is, because you have so little faith, ouch, truly I tell you, If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing is impossible for you. In other words, belief doesn't have this minimum requirement. Even faith as small as a mustard seed suffices in the face of impossibility. All things are possible for the one who believes, even just a little bit even just a mustard seed. Unbelief is a very real and very present tension in the reality of faith. Yet with even just the smallest seed of belief against it, unbelief has met its match. There's no scale, no percentages, no measuring of one against the other because there doesn't need to be. The value of belief is always worth more regardless of the quantity of your unbelief. I don't deny that the experience or unbelief or challenged faith is an overwhelmingly difficult one to navigate. It's one I know well. There's a reason I chose it for this morning to preach on, because I firmly believe in the idea of preaching first and foremost to yourself, and I found the need to remind myself that belief and faith is bigger than my unbelief and that God is in charge. So it's coming from a raw place this morning. I think it's one that anyone on an established faith journey knows well, though. Unbelief is rarely far from belief. So how do we manage the experience of unbelief within faith? Well, number one, we have to be honest. How brave of the boy's father in this story to admit his unbelief. I mean, Jesus had just commanded of him to have faith. And in response, this man opts for brutal honesty, an admission of unbelief as an existing reality in his experience of belief. He doesn't deny his doubts. He is honest about the struggle he is experiencing to have his heart and mind accept the truth that Jesus can heal. He is genuine about his desire to believe and his struggle to do so. How often are we honest about our questioning and our doubts in our own lives? Are we honest about it to ourselves? Are we honest about it to others? Point number two is on ways to manage the experience of unbelief within our faith is to rely on others. We see this a couple of times in this passage. Not only is the boy's father reaching out to Jesus and relying on him in his experience of unbelief, But the disciples did this too. When they couldn't perform the miracle at hand, they relied on Jesus to intervene. They knew in their hearts that he was able to be relied upon to cure the demon-possessed boy, even if in their heads they were still puzzled over why they weren't able to do it themselves. They knew with their belief that Jesus was reliable and would heal the child, even though their unbelief was the one reason that stood in the way of them completing the miracle themselves. When we are faced with the experience of unbelief alongside our belief, relying on Jesus is the answer. With even the smallest measure of belief, we can put our hope in Christ, knowing the harvest of that seed of faith will be fruitful. And number three, in ways that we can manage the experience of unbelief in faith. We need to focus on the fraction that matters. Regardless of the split between belief and unbelief, belief needs to have my attention. 
I need to focus on the fraction that matters. I think when we overemphasize our unbelief, we run the risk of damaging our understanding of God's faithfulness. If we ourselves are unfaithful through actions, thoughts or behaviours, we can distort our own idea of faithfulness and it can impact the way that we view God. Some of you may know I, uh, I write spoken word poetry uh, and I don't have it in me to perform the entire piece because it's not stuck in my memory, but I do want to share a little bit of a piece that I've written previously. And I tried and tried and tried to not have it weave its way into this sermon because I knew it would make me nervous, but God had other ideas. <laughs> the spoken word piece uh, begins with describing how a focus on our own imperfections can change the way we view God. And I just want to share a snippet. Some days, when I look into the mirror, I see this God I know. See, he happens to look a lot like me, as in my proportions often dictate his, his distortions and they reflect back barred by yellow tape reading caution, do not approach. My feelings fill in between the lines, colouring an untrue picture. And in this mirror, I see me, all too much of me, in this God I know. How easy is it to see ourselves in God or start placing our own limited human understandings and applying them to our understanding of a great big God? He is beyond my belief or unbelief and the struggle in between. He is greater, he is good, and he is faithful, even when my faithfulness is very damaged and very broken and very limited. As I said earlier, the value of belief is always worth more, regardless of the quantity of your unbelief. I don't know if this is a struggle that you are um, sympathising with or empathising with right now. I don't know whether um, you're experiencing unbelief in your current season or your current reality of faith. Maybe you're in a really good place. Um, but as Neil said earlier, none of us are immune to difficulty. We've all been there, we've all had a struggle, and you may be in that struggle right now. And the encouragement that I, that I get from reading this passage and, and, and seeing this is there is no shame in Jesus' response to this man's proclamation of unbelief. Jesus still performs the miracle. That man's unbelief is not enough to stop his belief having a place and God doing what he has promised. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up um, as we prepare to sing. I'm, I'm so, again, I'm so surprised at the, the way that the songs linked in this morning um, and we were able to sing of how great God's faithfulness to us is. Because despite my inequities, no matter how damaged my own ability to be faithful is God is still faithful to me like I said I'm preaching to myself this morning first and foremost um, and, and I thank you for listening to me as I, as I journey with this um, and I hope that it's been relevant to perhaps your own experience uh, whatever your struggle is whatever your um, whatever your relationship between belief or unbelief looks like right now but I think it's definitely a prayer that we can all relate to, to pray, God, help my unbelief. Because there's always going to be some of that attached to our faith. And it's always a prayer that strengthens our faith. To pray, God, help my unbelief, is a prayer to say, God, help me be more faithful. Help me to be stronger in my faith. Help me to be a better example of you. Help me to love others more and more. That's what I want to be. That's what I want to choose. And that's what I'm prioritizing. Yes, I believe, but help my unbelief. No matter how big or small that is, I pray God will help your unbelief. Thank you, team.
Amy. All right. We're going to have some announcements. I'm not sure who's doing them. Wes and Debbie will be looking at this and going, well, I'll see what happens when we're not there. It's the microphone. I keep... That ta- I just went down and took it off and Jess went, don't you need that on for the benediction and I went you're right so I had to reattach it but you know we're here. Uh, announcements. Uh, I'm, there we go. Uh, children's programs now we're still on school holidays so we are still on a break. Uh, Kids in the Kitchen and His Master Builders will return not the week ahead of us but the week after that. That's pretty exciting. Uh, Kids Church uh, that's last week's, um, but Kids Church is not on this week. Kids Church is on uh, not next week, but the week after. So again, the rule of thumb is if school's on during the week, Kids Church is on that Sunday. Um, we return on the 10th of the 10th. That is still correct information. Uh, Just Men Conference is in November. I feel like we've been announcing it forever, but the date did shift, so um, that's why it's still up there. So 13th of November, it's a one-day conference. Uh, it's looking like it's going to be amazing. See Corey for details. Uh, you can do that now because he is here. So please bug Corey about Just Men's Conference. Uh, it's going to be great, so please go there. Uh, Calvar Country Day, there are plenty of opportunities to serve. That's on the 16th of October. Uh, See Kylie if you would like to volunteer at the craft stall. See me if you'd like to volunteer with the drink stall. See Elsa if you would like to volunteer with the Devonshire Tea. I believe Elsa is uh, super organised and she's created a roster and everything for you to go fill out. But uh, if you'd like to help out in... Any other capacities, there's plenty of different ways in which you can serve. Um, And let's get all hands on deck. The other thing as well is, of course, our working bee the week before that so that we can get things looking nice and sorted uh, before 
Calabar Country Day and we have people coming in our space. So Working Bee is on the 9th uh, of October, which is a Saturday. Um, the more hands that we have around to help, the more um, we can get done uh, and the faster it goes. So please uh, lend us a hand on the 9th of October for the Working Bee. I believe that's all the announcements, which means it is time for the benediction. Don't take that off. I won't, yeah, I won't take the microphone off in between, in between both. So the benediction for this morning. Go with confidence into the days ahead, trusting in God's unfailing love and faithfulness. God will not abandon you, for you are the work of his hands, his own creation, and his love endures forever. So go enjoy and love to serve the Lord. Be blessed this morning. Thank you for joining us. We're going to sing He is Exalted to Finish. I'd love to tell you to stand up, but we better not do that. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted, forever exalted, and I will praise His name. Exalted, the King is exalted. 